Oh yeah, uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, don't take that as too much of a compliment because I'm from Newport, so it's lovely to be almost anywhere else. <laughs> Um, in 1905, Harry Houdini came to Newport, the famous uh, escapologist, uh, for a performance. And they put him in a straight jacket and they threw him off Newport Bridge into the water uh, to see if he'd come up again. And thankfully he did. Nowadays, of course, in Newport, if we put someone in a straight jacket and throw them into the water, that's just Saturday night out. <laughs> but for Harry Houdini, this was a performance. And um, when this happened in 1905, uh, my grandfather was 15 years old. He was an apprentice in the Valley's Butchers. And this poem imagines that he was there on a bank holiday Monday in 1905, watching Harry Houdini's performance. It's called Harry Houdini on Newport Bridge. He stands a hundred feet above a river that's popular with suicides and lovers. He stands there in the limelight and the weather, in padlocks, chains, a straight jacket, and his immaculate moustache. The whole town, gathered, watching, breathes in. He stands a hundred feet above the river and leaps. Meanwhile, in the crowd, my grandfather is busy being 15. He's presently engaged in tying the shoelaces of a policeman to those of the vicar, <laughs> lifting handkerchiefs from pockets to swap them with each other. Harry Houdini has been what? A minute and the water, and in the crowd, hands are being raised to mounds. A day off from my grandfather, from the family village butchers. He looks up at the chains on the watches of his father, his grandfather. A minute and a half, a woman on the bank points towards a darkness in the river, slowly turning to a bobbing head, moustache, a waving hand, a cheer. The woman starts to cry. Her husband reaches for his handkerchief. A policeman pulls a vicar from his feet. So this strategy of um, uh, writing about my family whilst also writing about famous people is something which runs through a number of these poems. I started off just writing about my family, but someone told me that if I did that, then only my family would read my poems. And I really love my family, but I was also keen to make some money. So I started throwing these famous people in, uh, and this is one of those poems. Um, it's about Evil Knievel, uh, the 1970s uh, stunt motorcyclist. And the poem imagines that for once, Evil Knievel is jumping over not double-decker buses and monster trucks, but rather members of my family. So this is called Evil Knievel Jumps Over My Family. I was doing a reading a couple of weeks ago and a guy said that he's already decided that if Evil Knievel ever jumped over his family, which member of his family he would put at the end of the row as the bike was coming down. A floodlit Wembley, Lisa, a producer, swears into her walkie-talkie. We Edwardses, four generations, stand in line between ramps, smile for the cameras. My great-grandparents twiddle their thumbs in wheelchairs. As Lisa tells us to relax, Mr. Knievel has faced much bigger challenges, double-deckers, monster trucks, though the giraffe is urban legend. Evil Knievel enters, eye of the tiger drowned by cheers, his costume tassels, his costume a slipstream, his anxious face an act to pump the crowd, surely. My mother, always a warrior, asks about the ambulance. Evil Knievel salutes, accelerates towards the ramps. I close my eyes, then open them. Is this what heaven feels like? Some motorcycle Liberace overhead, wheels resting on air? Are these flashes from 60,000 cameras the blinding light coma survivors speak of? Before he lands, 
There's just time to glance along the line. Though no one said a thing, all we editors are holding hands. This poem has a very similar strategy. Um, it's based um, slightly more in reality. The village um, next up the valley from where I live is called Crumlin. Uh, it's an old um, ex-mining village in the valleys. And they had an amazing um, viaduct there in the 1960s. It was demolished in the 1960s. Um, it was swept right across the valley, this amazing railway bridge. And Hollywood was shooting this movie called Arabesque, uh, which featured Sophia Loren and Gregory mm -hmm. Peck. And they needed a viaduct to film a particular scene on. So a uh, massive Hollywood film crew, Gregory Peck, Sophia Loren, turn up in this tiny Welsh mining village in the 60s. And of course, when that happens, everyone from Mars around goes there to try and get a look at them. And one of the people who went there that day in 1965, um, I think chiefly to get a look at Sophia Loren, was my father, uh, who was about 20 at this point. So this poem uses all of this to get to my father as a young man. Sunday. The crowd beneath the viaduct waves banners made from grocery boxes, bed sheets. Welcome to the valleys, Mr. Peck. Wind turns their chapel dresses into floral parachutes. Their perms don't budge an inch. The emotion of it's too much for one girl's mascara. We love you, Mr. Red. My father parks away from them around the corner, in his brand new car, a 30s Lanchester, with stop-start brakes, a battery he shares with a neighbour. All sideburns and ideas, a roll-up behind one year and a flea in the other from my grand for missing Eucharist. He coughs and steps down from the running board as two Rolls Royces pull up opposite. Gregory Peck, three years after being at Finch, steps from one, says, good morning. From the other, it isn't. It is, wearing her cheekbones. My father's breakfast is nervous in his stomach, but he grabs his Argus, pen, and yes, they'll sign. Her high heels echo away through the whole valley. That's how my father tells it. Let's cross over how his filming dates aren't quite the same as Google's. The way Sophia Loren formed her S's suspiciously like his. Let's look instead at this photo of the crowd gathered that day he walked towards to share those autographs, his fame. There, front and middle, with her sister, the girl he hasn't met yet. There, my mother. I'll read this thing. This is um, this is uh, an invitation poem. Um, it was it was written to try and um, persuade someone to come from London to visit Newport. Uh, which you might think is a very odd thing to write a poem about because why on earth would anyone need to be persuaded to visit Newport? It just sort of beckons people towards it, doesn't it, of its own accord and needs no poems. Nonetheless, this was written with that purpose. Uh, it's called Song. So come to me, by plane, by train, by car, by unicycle girl, by self-drive van, by Twitter, FaceTime, or by sleight of hand. O oh, lease yourself a pack mule, a giraffe. O oh, steal yourself a moped. Pay a man to carry you here, girl, on piggyback. Or get the railway to lay extra track up to my door, up to my waiting hands. So come to me. On fresh air, on credit. O oh, hoof it, leg it. Go by Shanks' pony over stony ground and live off grass or hedgerow, girl, whatever you can forage, and rest on riverbanks beneath a roof of forest. Navigate your way by stars or GPS, but listen, girl, be quick. Oh, speed yourself towards my waiting skin. 
So come to me. Oh, score yourself again, a false moustache girl and a native tongue, and smuggle yourself in the early hours, under wire and across the border. Or buy yourself a wrecked and promising motorhome, and let dawn find you, girl, with oil-stained cheeks, just working till it purrs or goes. Or oh, drive towards my waiting bones. So come, by raft, by hovercraft, or do a goose fat, nose clipped, brave, or water winged breaststroke through the sea that's parting me from you, or fit a tractor engine to a lilo, rub a ring, a rowing boat. My home's made by these hands, this skin, these bones. My home is made of straw and fragile stars. Oh, come to me. Oh, meet this where you are. And just uh, one more poem. I couldn't um, come to Manchester on a day when Manchester United were playing in the FA Cup final without reading a poem about football. This is a poem about um, the Welsh national football team. Uh, and this. Um, Date, June 13th, 14th, when Wales were playing England and the Euros is kind of inscribed in my head. The problem with um, writing a poem about the Welsh national football team, of course, is that there are so many moments of enormous glory in our history that finding just one to pin down and write a poem about is not an easy task. Uh, they spent some time with the Welsh national football team in 1991. Um, they were playing the match against Germany and just won the World Cup. Um, and there was no way they could win this match, but they did. Ian Rush scored and they won one 0 And this was the first football match that I ever went to with my father. Um, I was about twelve at this point. So it uses um, it uses this as background to get to my father again. Um, it opens at half time in the Welsh changing room. Uh, so I'll finish with this with, with great thanks for, for listening and for having me. Nil nil. Once the changing room doors closed, the Germans out of sight. The Welsh team can collapse. There's Kevin Ratcliffe, belly up on the treatment table. Sparky uses his body, socks in the corner, floppy as the curls which he had then. All half, they barely had a kick. Big Neff Southall throws his gloves to the floor like plates in a Greek restaurant. As, in tracksuit and belly, Terry Yorath looks round at a room of Panini faces. He doesn't know yet he will never get them to a major finals. He does know what to say. Ryan Giggs, still young enough to be in a boy band, stands up, doing an impression of his poster on my wall. The crowd begins to ask for guidance from the great Jehovah, and Ian Rush's famous goal-scoring moustache perks up. He's half an hour away from the goal that cues the song that makes his name five syllables. What he doesn't know is I'm in the stand in my father's coat, storing things to tell at school next day. My father pours more tea from his work flask and says, we got them now, but watch, and asks again if I'm too cold. What we don't know is we'll speak of this 20 years from now. One of us retired, one a teacher in a stadium they'll build down by the river. But now it's rushy, sparky, southall, gigs. 8.45, the crowd begins to roar, wants to be fed until they want no more. The tea tastes just like metal, it's too hot, and something catches right here on the town. The changing room door opens and they step out, toe touching, stretching, staring into the future. It's time to be the people we'll become.